Hey everybody. Today we're combining data sets in R using the bind rows function from the dplyr package. This is useful when you have observations of the same type spread across multiple data frames and you'd like to smash them all together to just get one set for the purposes, for instance, of visualization, modeling, or wrangling. I'm going to be working with a toy example from that's based on the msleep data set, classic. I've made three smaller data sets, msleep1, 2, and 3, each of which consists of two observations and two variables from those data sets. So for instance, uh, msleep1 has the cheetah and the dog um, from as well as the genus of those two species as seen in the msleep data set. M sleep two has the cow and the goat, and M sleep three has the red fox and the mole rat. So ultimately, I'd like to combine this into one data set that just that has uh, six entries in those same variables. To start, I just want to look at M sleep one and M sleep two. And the most basic thing that we can do here is just to bind the rows of those two data sets. So M sleep one and M sleep two. There we go. And you can see. We have four observations, as we would hope, along with the same variables that we had before. Notice that in msleep1 and msleep2, the columns match up exactly one to one. We have two columns, name, NAME, and genus, G-E-N-U-S, so it's very simple for R to combine these two. Um, one piece of alternative syntax that's worth seeing here is um, we can also pass bind rows, uh, bind rows a list. So let's just use the list function to um, make a, a list that includes both of these two data frames. So msleep1 and msleep2. And we'll just print that so you can see the basic structure of the list. So now there's two entries, bracket bracket1 and bracket bracket2, each of which is a data frame. And so what we can do here is just bind rows for the sleep list. And it's going to work exactly like the um, the previous version that we had here. So this could be uh, an efficient way of binding a lot of data sets together. Now, one very common situation that you might run into is that you want to keep track of where the particular rows came from. So looking back at msleep1 and msleep2, uh, I'd like to keep track of the fact that the cheetah came from this first set while the cow came from the second. So for instance, maybe I have two different researchers. I'd like to have their name in the new set. For instance, then if there's a problem with one of the researchers or one of the data sets, I still have it later on. And um, we can do this either with the list or with the, uh, the raw form. Let's go ahead and stick with the list version since we have this on the bottom. And um, the extra argument we need to add is dot ID. And we need to give the name of a new column that's going to identify what set things came from. And so let's call it researcher. And you can see now we have a new column called researcher 1122. So the cheetah came from the first set, the cow came from the second set, and so on. Now, you might not love those numbers one and two. Here they literally are just saying this is um, the one is from the first data set we passed, the two is from the second. Oftentimes you'll want to replace those with actual names, you know, so maybe we had a couple of researchers here, um, George and Sarah. So this isn't exactly in the bind rows function, but it's, uh, it's a common enough use case. Let's go ahead and handle this. In order to modify one of our columns, we're going to use the mutate function. So we'll pipe the data frame we were just looking at into mutate. We want to modify the researcher column. So we're going to overwrite it. And the way we're going to do it is by recoding this variable. So I'm going to use the factor recode function from the lubridate package. Inside of factor recode, I have to say the factor variable that I want to recode. So researcher. And then I need to say the names of the new values and the corresponding values that they're replacing. So let's say researcher one is George. <laughs> and uh, so that's going to be one. And uh, let's say researcher two is Sarah. And I'm putting quotes around all of this. I believe you can leave out the quotes on the names, the new names, but not the old names. So it's a, the factor recode is a little bit fiddly in that way. All right, great. There we are. We've got our two researchers, George and Sarah. 
as um, listed in this column, saying that uh, the cheetah and the dog were George's, while the cow and the goat were Sarah's. Great. Um, let's see here. The next thing that I would like to do is to um, consider what might happen if the names of the data sets don't match up exactly. And to start, I just want to point out examples from the help file. Um, the text at the very top of the help file lets us know that output will contain all columns that appear in any of the inputs. So unlike the rbind function, this can actually add columns to an output. And in the examples here, and I'll just click run examples, we can see a situation where that's the case. So they build two data frames. The first one has the variables x and y. The second one has the variables x and z. The columns don't match up exactly. So when bind rows is executed, we still get all the different x values, 1, 2, 4, and 5. We get all three variables, but there are some NAs inserted. So for instance, um, these first two values here from, from data frame 1 have x and y, but no z. And so we can see the z's are NAs. Sometimes that's the behavior you want. The main thing I want to talk about here is what can happen when that's not the behavior you want, which is honestly frequently the case. And that's why I um, brought msleep3 in here. So let's just kind of see what happens when I do my bind rows oops, on um, msleep2 and msleep3. So what ended up happening here is that when I coded in msleep3 intentionally, I put in the column name for the name of the animal with a capital N. So really name and name are supposed to be representing the same variable here. There's just been a different naming convention in each of the two. And so this makes it look like there's actually missing names for some of these for, um, the, um, for cow and goat when we actually already, of course, have the name here. What we would like to see instead is um, the fox and the rat over here with this column on the right, capital N-A-M-E, not there. So um, the thing that we're gonna need to do here is to rename the columns to make sure that they have the same names and then bind them together using bind rows. So uh, let's take msleep3 and use the rename function and maybe I'll just pull up the help file for rename really quickly so that we can remember how that works. Changes the names of individual variables using, oh, look at this, the same sort of syntax that we used for the factor recode. New name equals old name. One thing I appreciate about the tidyverse is that the syntax tends to be um, fairly consistent between different functions, even when the functions are coming from pretty different parts of the tidyverse. Obviously, there's exceptions to that, but I really do think they do their best with that. And so the um, new name for the column in msleep3 that I want is going to be name. And let's quote that for consistency. And the old name is going to be name with capitals. And let's just check to make sure that came out right. And it did. I believe in this situation, we can also leave out some of these quotes, but just for consistency, I'm leaving them in. Okay, so now that msleep3 is where we want it, let's pipe it into msleep, I'm sorry, let's pipe it into rbind with msleep2. And while we're at it, let's get msleep1 in there. There we go. So now we have all six observations combined into one data frame that um, has the names of the columns, name and genus. So everything is nice and uh, nice and tidy and well organized here. As I wrap up, I want to point out how um, the R bind function, the older base R function, differs in small ways. And I use this one almost as much as I use bind rows. There's not a huge difference between the two. But for comparison purposes, I'm going to apply R bind to msleep2 and msleep3. So if you remember, when I did bind rows, on those two data sets, I got this weird result where I had this extra column. So in this situation, it was not the desired behavior, but it did work and it worked in a way that made sense, that would make sense in some circumstances. For instance, the one we saw in the help file. By contrast, rbind, when I hit command enter on this command, 
throws an error that the names of the columns do not match. So this has the advantage of, uh, of really being explicit about the rows needing to match up and throwing an error if they don't. So it doesn't let you proceed um, when the output might not be what you're expecting and it defaults strongly towards stopping you. As opposed to buying rows, which does its best to keep working regardless. So the one you're using is a little bit a matter of preference, a little bit of coding philosophy. Um, the one thing I would say is that in either case, um, whether you're using bind rows or R bind, I think it's a good idea to not just uh, uh, blindly jump in with the function, but rather to actually look at the variables that you have to think about the structure of your data sets and to take it into account as you code. As usual, I'll throw this code up on uh, to my GitHub, link down below, so that you can uh, run through this on your own. In particular, you don't have to rebuild the msleep1, 2, and 3 datasets from scratch. Thanks for watching, everybody. Don't forget to like and subscribe.